Welcome tonight. We're going to be back in Romans chapter 4. Tonight we'll look in verses 13 through 25. So if you want to get a head start and really look spiritual, go ahead and mark your place. Okay. Every once in a while, I heard uh, Chuck Swindoll say this one time. He said that he, he called out a, a scripture and they kept turning. And kept, you could hear the pages just rattling all over the church. He said, I'm, I'm grateful to God that everyone brought their Bibles, but it really concerns me that it's taking you a long time to find it. So we're going to have Bible drill next Sunday, so we'll do that. Those of you who are older, you know what Bible drill is, right, Miss Doors? Okay, let's pray and get started tonight. Our Father, we thank you and praise you for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed Son of God, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, took our place so that we could be made righteous, but only in Him. There's no other way. It's hard to say that, Lord, but it sounds odd to the world when we celebrate His death because that's what our salvation So, Father, we ask tonight that as we remember his death, we also remember his resurrection. And that's the perfect picture of salvation. We were dead in our trespasses and sin, but Jesus has given us life through faith by grace. Oh, God, we thank you. We give you praise and honor tonight. Help us again as we study in your powerful word. May it find its way into the depths of our souls to encourage us, to give us confidence in these days. In Jesus' name. About a lot Amen. of things, but bottom line is, is that Abraham's trust is not in what he possessed, but in what he was promised. What he was promised. And the title of this message, and I failed to mention today because I got, I started chasing that truth, but is simply this: Abraham allowed God to be God. Had nothing to do about him serving, had nothing to do that God was, you know, some kind of eternal blessing machine and that Abraham just happened to be in the right place at the right time. No, no. He allowed God to be God in his life. And that's what I want to challenge you with tonight as we finish this text. Allow God to be God in your life. Let him be your God. Let him be God and Lord over everything that's in your life. Not just the, the problems and the big stuff that comes, but how about the everyday things? How about the things that no one else sees, but you know? Uh, maybe something that causes you to be anxious, something fearful, something that you're doubt, doubting about, something that uh, I mentioned fearful, the fact that maybe there's, there's certain things that intimidate you and it just causes you just to be nervous about. He wants you to be... Uh, full of his joy that he wants to pour out on you. But yet, you know, we, we, there's always these, these things that come after us. You know, it's, it's like a, I, I went by one time, we had a lady in our church at Calvary years ago, uh, Carolyn Hooker. David, you remember Carolyn. Carolyn was fun now. Uh, she had a little dog named Rudy. It was a little chihuahua, and that was the meanest dog on the face of the earth. And when, Sandy would go, and, and, and Rudy liked Sandy. He didn't like me. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty nice guy, I thought. And I'd go, and, and I'd always get ready to pray with Carolyn, and Carolyn, I'd hold her hands, and here he comes. He's on a chain, and he is, he is just eating me up. He's chewing on my shoe. He's trying to get me, and he had them little, you know, little chihuahua teeth. You know, they're mean little jokers. And, and so I, I just kind of reached over, and I, I got his chain, and I kind of pinned him down so he wouldn't bite me. And he's growling and fighting and everything. And I got through praying, and then Carolyn <laughs> looks at me, like, you know, I've, I've just killed Goliath or something, you know. And Sandy's going, how, how can't you do that, that little dog? I said, that, that thing is biting me, you know, in my self-defense. So then from now on, I just kind of went all the way around because I knew how far his chain would come out. Well, there's those little things out there that bite you. It's called sin. It could be temptation. It could be trials. And you don't know what to do with them. Well, let God be God. He's the only one who can deal with those. He's the only one who can handle those things. And that's what Paul is trying to teach us about Abraham. Only God can do these things. And I remember the notice that, remember the order we talked about this morning? Abraham's faith. He was 75 years old when he left the Ur of the Chaldees. That's when he, he began trusting God. He left his works behind. He was a moon worshiper. He was a businessman in the Ur of the Chaldees. But here's what's interesting. 
24 years later, at the age of 99, that's when he was circumcised. He was obeying God, going through the steps, and we talked about that that was a sign of the covenant. That was a Jewish sign. Then the law wasn't given until 430 years after Abraham believed. Moses came 430 years later, and he, he brought the, the Ten Commandments, the book of Leviticus, all of that, 430 years later. The point of that is, is that Abraham was trusting God from age 75, and then, you know, 25 years later, then he comes and he's circumcised, he's just obeying God, and then 430 years later comes the law. So Abraham was not saved because he kept the law. He was not saved because he was circumcised. No, he was saved before then. He was just trusting God. Look back again in verse 12 of Romans 4. Abraham, the father of circumcision, to those who not only are of the circumcision, now that's Jew, the Jews, circumcision, but, also, but who also walk in the steps of faith which our father Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. The point that he's trying to prove here, and we've talked about this now, and you say, well, why do you keep saying it? Because I, I want you to get it. Because the next time that you share your testimony, you hear somebody talking about their faith in Christ, you need to be aware of that they say, well, you know, well, I, I'm going to heaven because I earned it or I'm working for it or because I've done this, God is going to accept me. No, 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 no. And you say, well, David, that's, that's going to be offensive. No, that's going to be telling the truth. If you tell them they're okay and they're safe just because they, they have done something, that's not what the Bible says. Abraham, I mean, he's the father of our faith. I mean, he taught us how to be saved by taking God at his word. It's not what he possessed. It's not what he did. It's what God gave him in promises. So we looked at the steps. Go back to Genesis 12 just for a moment. We're going to run over this real quick. Genesis 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Here's God's initial calling Abraham to salvation and justification. And remember, God's doing all of this labor, all of this work. Now, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your people and from your father's house to a land that, there's seven of these, I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth, you shall be blessed. Verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord. That's what he did after God gave him the seven promises. Here's the steps of faith. Abram, I will do these seven things. And then Abraham, out of just being blessed and grateful and thankful, he built an altar and he worshiped God. We went to Ephesians 1. It talks about how that you heard the word of truth in whom also after having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We went to Hebrews 11.8 and it's by faith Abraham obeyed when after he was called, after the commandments were announced. Not before. He didn't do anything until God called him to himself. The Bible says in John 6.44 that the Father draws us to him. You cannot be saved unless God draws you. It's God's invitation. Same thing with Abraham. Faith is simply obedience to what God tells you to do. That's faith. But notice that it comes after we act on God's promise. We act upon God's word. Now tonight, down to verse 13, back over in Romans 4. Abraham was justified by God's grace through faith, justified. God's doing this. God's doing the, not only the saving and the justifying, God is doing everything, not just for Abraham, but for us also. Grace gives and faith receives. Look in verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those, verse 14, if those who are of the law, now that's the Jews, are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. In other words, all you have to do is be born Jewish and you're okay? No. 
Paul says no. Now, understand who he's talking to, but you also have to understand who he is. Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knew the Old Testament law backwards and forwards. And what happened to Paul after he was saved? Galatians tells us in chapter 1 that he spent three years in the desert alone with God. And they weren't building sandcastles. God was taking all of the Old Testament law and he was helping Saul to understand that now it's all about grace and it's all about Jesus whom he met on the road to Damascus and now that's what God says, I will save you if you come to Christ because Christ is the only one who could fulfill the law. He's the only one who could keep all of the law more than the Ten Commandments. Only Jesus was the one who can do it. So when we say, well, all have sinned and fallen short except Jesus. That's why God accepted him as the sacrifice for our sin. See? Verse 14, for if those who are of the law, that's Jews, are heirs, then faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Watch 15. Because the law brings about wrath. Look back, if you would. Chapter 3, verse 20 of Romans. Chapter 3, verse 20. Paul writing, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But what was the law given for? The law was given to us to expose our sinfulness, to show the fact that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, you've still fallen short. Okay, and then I want you to look at chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. Romans. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit, not in the letter, that's the law, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Longer grace. In other words, if it's about works, then grace doesn't matter. But if it is of works, but if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. It, it, sometimes Paul talks like he's he's speaking backwards. But what he's simply saying is, he says it, either going to be saved by grace, because then it voids out any kind of works, or if you think you can be saved by works, then it voids out grace. That's his point. So back to Romans four. Verse 15, because the law brings about wrath, the law only has one answer, judgment, the wrath of God. We use that example. For the wages of sin is what? Death. That's it. That's all the law can do for you. The law can't give you new nature. The law can't give you forgiveness. The law has no mercy. It has no grace in it. Then he says this, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Now what does that mean? Because we're under grace, I'm not under the law. I'm putting my faith in Christ. There's no transgressions. There's no trespasses. There's nothing. There's no indictment. There's, there's, I'm not guilty of anything. Why? Because I'm in Christ. You remember when we talked about this last week? That when, when does the, the actual sentence comes forth against us when we stand before God? God draws you to himself. Think about the day you were saved. God was drawing you to, he was convicting you, he was convincing you of your need for a Savior and that Christ was your only hope. And so you came to Christ and it was at that moment when you said, I am guilty, I am a sinner. That's when the sentence went forth. Now what happened? Because when you said, I am guilty, I'm a sinner, I'm putting my faith in Christ, then what does God say? You're not guilty because all of your sins have been transferred to Christ. It's by faith. So how do you know it worked? Peace? Joy? Even, even though when I was first saved, I had no knowledge of the Bible whatsoever, yet God was doing that in, in my heart and in my life that I couldn't explain. It wasn't mystery, because I was experiencing it. But then as I, <coughs> as I began to grow in faith, in knowledge of God's Word, then I realized what was happening to me. We're sin abound. We're sin abound. Grace did much more abound. That He loved me with an everlasting love. That I call upon the name of the Lord and 
and, and he gave me everlasting life. All of those things, just all of a sudden, it all made sense. It's overwhelmed me. Now, you may not know this, but I'm not a real crier. But when I do cry, it's ugly. I mean, hey, I got... <laughs> it's, it's, but I mean, I had some times like that. It just... I'd be coming over from work, and I was in construction, and I'd be sitting there, and, and all of a sudden something would hit me, and I'd have to pull off on the side of the road. I was, just, I was all messed up. Couldn't even drive. Could not believe that God would do that for me. And I kept saying, I don't deserve it. And I said, mm-hmm, you don't deserve it. <laughs> I said, I can't believe this. Believe it, because it's happening to you. He's just changing your life. And you had the same experiences. Maybe not as dramatic. <laughs> a guy went to, went to Bible college with Bobby. He, Bobby was a mess. And he'd say, Brother Dave, when you got saved, did you have snot bubbles coming out of your nose? I said, what? He goes, yeah. I go, well, yeah, I kind of sort of did, but I didn't let anybody see it. That's what I'm talking about. Faith is rational. Listen to this. Believing and trusting in a person depends on the reliability of the person being trusted. That makes sense. It is always reasonable to trust the trustworthy. So what do we look for in a person that would qualify them to be trustworthy? God is more trustworthy than anyone. So, but how can we know that? How can he prove that? And you say, well, wait a minute. No, we need something we can hang our hat on. Before, listen. Faith is rational, rational because it draws conclusions from facts. We have the facts in God's Word, and we hear the Gospel, and the Holy Spirit takes all of that and then draws us to God, convincing us. And then when we come to that moment when, it's, when God says, okay, what are you going to do with all the facts? What are you going to do with Jesus? There's two attributes that God has. See, when I first got saved, I didn't even know what attribute it was. But think about this, two attributes, God's power and God's faithfulness. And all of these, these two were foundational to what Abraham believed. And it's right here in our text. Look with me in verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, who are Jewish, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Now remember, Paul is quoting this from where? Genesis 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. I will make you a father of many nations. Now, in the presence of him whom he believed, God. Now watch this. Who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So here's two pieces of evidence concerning God's power. How powerful is God? Well, God who gives life to the dead, that's resurrection power. We say, yeah, we know about Jesus. Wait a minute. What about Abraham? How old is he when God gives him the heir named Isaac? He's 99 years old, 100 years old. God resurrected procreation life in Abraham and Sarah so that they could have a child. It was completely beyond Abraham and Sarah, but yet God did that. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. That's creation. Listen, death is one event over which we have no control and for which we cannot escape. But from nothingness, creation, and death, we have resurrection, it's no problem for God. Now keep that in mind. And think about when Abraham realized this, that the world was created out of nothing, and God spoke it into being. Okay, now Abraham knows this. Out of death, he raised Jesus from the dead. Okay, now Abraham didn't know about that yet. So what does this have to do with Abraham's faith? Look in verse 18. Who contrary to hope, this is Abraham, in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. So wait a minute, I'm, I'm still having trouble here. Look in verse 19. And Abraham not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. 
He was 100 years old and she was 90. That's all in Genesis 17. Yet out of this double death, Abraham and Sarah, God brought life. At the same time, we see creation and resurrection. He created Isaac. Only God can do that. Only God can make babies. All right, you say, no, male and female. Only God can make babies. But had to be a resurrection involved. You see the power of God? But you see what happens is we've, we've become so accustomed to it. You know, well, you know they have babies. And, you know, no, 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 no. Go back to Psalm 139 and read that real careful. He knew me in the lower parts before I was brought to pass. This is the God that Abraham believed in. This same faith carried over to Mount Moriah with Isaac. Turn to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Look in verse 17. Hebrews 11, 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises, God's power, creation and resurrection, he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, verse 18, of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called, verse 19, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. That's why Abraham did not blink when he had Isaac on that on that on the on the wood and he was getting raising the knife and he's getting ready to take his life. Remember the question, Father, where is the lamb? God will provide himself with the lamb. And as Abraham raises that knife up, and this was the heir that God had promised Abraham, and yet God, listen, it, it's not what he possessed. What did he possess? He possessed Isaac. Isaac was his son, his chosen son. And yet he was still counting on the promise of God, not on what he possessed. The promise of God was over, more powerful, more faithful, over the, what he possessed. And so he was going to take that, and God stopped him and said, stop. Now I know your heart. But Abraham was going to take the life of Isaac, throw away all the ethicals. He was going to take the life because he believed, because if this, child, and this child was the promised child, that God would resurrect him if Abraham took his life. Fast forward 2,000 years. Jesus suffered and died on the cross. Isaiah 53, he shed all his blood. He gave up his soul. And yet... The world at that time in the first century said, it's over. Satan said, I've got him. But they all forgot about one thing. Abraham's faith and the power of the resurrection. And then Jesus came forth out of the grave. And that's the resurrection life that he gives us. The resurrection life is the power to say yes to God and no to sin. Go back to Genesis 4. Look in verse 20. Notice how that Abraham grew stronger in his faith. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. You see that? What he was possessing, he had life, he had the son, he's a teenager. He said, but he did not waver. Look what it says. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham never doubted that God was not going to keep his promise. Abraham, it wasn't about possessions. It was about the promise of God. Now let me speak something personal here. And, and many of you in here tonight have, have, have experienced this. When that loved one that you love so dearly, I mean, it, we could say it's your prized possession, and I understand. I do. I do. Because I've lost some loved ones that I love dearly. But if we focus on the possession and we forget about the promise, then the heartache is even worse. But you know what, though? God in His grace, He's patient with us. After that possession has gone home to be with Him, He reminds us of the promise again. And that's what He does. That's God's grace. He doesn't shame us. He waits patiently. And then that truth, that His promise, just like, just like with Abraham, He did not waver the promise. You know what? Then that promise means more now than anything else. When we say Jesus saves, He saves to the uttermost. 
Jesus saves, we are guaranteed that we're going to be in heaven with him one day, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. I understand that. But one day, we'll all be together. In the rapture of the church, it says that when Jesus comes, he's going to bring them who've gone on with him, and they're going to stop in the clouds. Then the dead in Christ, their body is going to be brought up out of the grave, instantaneously put back together, and those of us who are on the earth who are alive, we're going to be caught up, and so shall we be with them in the air, and then we're going back to heaven. That's the promise that we count on. That's what we count on. Abraham was through his obedience and faith, he was letting God be God. See, there's the point. We have to let God be God. We have to trust him. I'm not saying there's not tears. I'm not saying that we don't get upset and, you know, annoyed and, 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 and might get angry. But yet, let God be God because he is, and we just let him. But God in his amazing grace and his patience with us, he works through it with us. And then those promises become so powerful and so precious. Look at verse 21. Here's the second attribute. The first one was God's power. Here's God's faithfulness. Verse 21. And Abraham being fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Now, this is before all of this stuff happened with Isaac. He was fully convinced. Now, where did that come from? All right, wait. Let's say Isaac was 18 years old. Let's back up 18 years. Abraham, you're 100. Sarah, you're 90. All of a sudden, Sarah's pregnant. You remember when God came and told her that she's going to be pregnant, that this time next year you're going to have a baby? What did she do? She laughed. And God said, why did Sarah laugh? She's sitting by the t tent flap, by the way. She's, she's snooping, and she's listening. And she goes, that isn't going to happen. Why did Sarah laugh? I didn't laugh. Oh, that voice came out of nowhere. Oh, yes, she did laugh. Yes, she did. Go to Hebrews 11. I think it's 17. Watch this one. Mm, nope. Let me find it. 11. Hebrews 11, 11. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. Now, where did that creative act come from? God. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. So Abraham and Sarah both are what? Growing in their faith. They're confident. So back to Romans 4.21. And being fully convinced that what God had promised, God was also able to perform. And therefore, verse 22, it was accounted to him for righteousness, Abraham was fully convinced. Now, let's be honest here. When all of this is taking place, Abraham's 100 years old. But let's back up when he was 75. Let's back up when he's 86 and Ishmael shows up. What was going on there? Was he fully convinced then? If Abraham would have been fully convinced like he was when he was 100, he wouldn't have done what he did when he was 86 when Sarah said, just take Hagar, she'll have a child for me, and then we'll claim it's mine. And Abraham, because he was tired of all the fuss and fighting, he said, okay, fine. And well, now we got Ishmael. Well, boy, that blew up. So then Sarah comes back and says, I can't believe you did this to me. But you, you, it, now... He says, I'm going to go out and live in the desert. I don't know what he did, but anyway. But that's what happened. But now, at age 100, he's fully convinced. And then, how about when he's about 118 in Genesis 22, when he takes Isaac and he ties him up and he lays him on that wood pile, he is more than fully convinced. He's persuaded. God's faithfulness. Whether people keep their promises or not depends not only on their power, but also on the character of the person who makes them. Abraham knew this as he contemplated his own weakness of age and Sarah's barrenness, yet he never hesitated because he was not being concerned about what he possessed and what he could do himself. He was counting on the promise of God. He reminded himself of God's power and faithfulness. Faith always looks at the problems 
in the light of the promises. You take the promises of God and you filter everything through those, His promises, His Word. Abraham was fully convinced that what he had promised, what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Verse 22, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's the results. So that, let's close. Look at this. Here's the lessons. Verses 23 through 25. Here, here's, here's the lessons that Paul is, is teaching us. Verse 23. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, Abraham, that it was imputed to him, but also for us it shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses, that means we're sinners, and was raised because of our justification. So the same God who credited faith to Abraham as righteous will credit righteousness to us if we also believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead and who was delivered for our offenses and who was raised again for our justification. You, can you call to mind what 2 Corinthians 5.17 is all about? We, we quote it all the time. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? There it is. Power to change. A new creation. Same thing happened with Abraham. Abraham's trust in God, his faith in God to make him righteous was not in what he personally possessed, but it's what was promised to him from God. Abraham was justified because he believed God's promise. Now these are the basics. It is vital that we understand that it was not his, Abraham's faith that saved him. Now listen carefully. See, this is where we can get... It was, not, it was not Abraham's faith that saved. Abraham's faith that saved. But it was the promise of God that saved him. Now is there a difference? Yes, listen. The difference is in whether a person attempts to save himself. That's my faith. This is all mine. This is what I'm doing. Which we cannot do. Or is God's salvation being understood and appreciated for what it truly is? It's a promise. It's a gift. Go back to Romans 4.4. 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. So if we're working our way to heaven, God owes us a debt. Okay? And you know what the wages of sin is. The debt paid is death. But it's as grace. God saves us by grace. Again, go to Ephesians 2. And we'll pray. You know this verse. We quote it. But let's read 8, 9, and 10. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man or anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And what did He do with Abraham in Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3, and down in verse 7? God says, here are the steps of faith. I will do this for you, and you walk in them. I will give, I will do, I will do, I will do, I will do, and I will, then you walk. And after Abraham received the promise of God, he obeyed. What did he do? He left the earth of the Chaldees and he started walking with God. Look in verse 10 again. Ephesians 2. For we are his workmanship. His. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God hath prepared beforehand that we should what? Walk in them. Walk. Implies obedience. And obedience implies trust. Just trusting God. Let God be God. It's not our possessions. It's the promises of God. Let that be the filter of everything in our life. No matter what our circumstances are, no matter where we are, no matter what we've done in the past, today, we stand on His promises. 
We stand on his promises. I'm a child of the king. Is that because you say so? No, because he said so. I'm a child of the king. He adopted me. And he has some strange children. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. And as we continue to march through the book of Romans, we understand more and more what we have in Jesus. And oh, Father, may it become more and more precious to us each time we meet. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Barry's going to come, and I'm going to ask you to stand, and if I can encourage you in any way, I'll be here at the front. Let's stand together. Barry. J.C., close us tonight, sir, please. Gracious Father, we thank you for this day and the opportunity we had to come here, Lord, and hear your word preached. Thank you, Lord, for your word and what it tells us, Lord, in your presence is full of some joy. And concentrating on you is what keeps us there. Lord, we're, we're born again, we're yours, we'll be there before that daily in and out fellowship with you we need in the worst kind of way. Because, Lord, it says, when we stand in your presence, we're filled with that joy that only comes from you. Holy Spirit, this week you come and you keep us in the right path of walking with you. You come, Lord, with great conviction and show us those areas in our life where we tend to stray and get out of fellowship with you. Holy Spirit, you'll keep us in the light. You'll keep us walking in the Spirit. And therein, Lord, lies our secret to living for you. Lord, we thank you for loving us. Lord, we thank you for saving us. Lord, we thank you for Jesus and the difference he makes in our life. Lord, in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.